through this. Again, my name is Jeff Moss. I'm the Metro GIS coordinator. Uh, Metro GIS is, in, is part of the Metropolitan Council. We have a Metropolitan Government in Minnesota that handles things like wastewater and transit and light rail uh, in the seven county metro area. And I'm very, very grateful to, 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 be, to have the chance here. Thank you so much to Sarah and to Martin for the very handsome invitation to come and be with you this morning. And what I'm going to talk about, uh, my presentation is uh, called Free and Open Geospatial Data in Minnesota. Um, kind of policy and practice, and I'll give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. I'll very briefly explain what Metro GIS is. It's kind of a unique experiment we have going uh, in the Metro. Um, I'll give you some quick context of what's happening in Minnesota. Um, I'll talk about very clearly what free and open data means, what those terms actually mean for us in the geospatial community. Um, I'll talk about the exact kinds of data we're looking at. Um, talk about some of the benefits we're beginning to realize in Minnesota, and also uh, link you to some of our uh, research that we've done that hopefully you can uh, make, maybe make some use from, from if you're looking to begin to open up your data. So what is Metro GIS? Metro GIS is not the GIS department of the Metropolitan Council. Obviously the Metropolitan Council is a very large organization created by the state legislature. We've got about 4,000 employees if you include everyone who drives buses and repairs the buses and drives the trains and does all the IT work and we have a planning um, wing as well and we do all the wastewater treatment in the seven county metro. So it's a very, very large organization. Um, we actually have the ninth largest police force in the state, the Metro Transit Police that can be, that you know, patrol calls along all the transit routes if a, if a bus uh, breaks down, if there's a safety or an issue, they handle that. So we're actually a, a reasonably large um, government organization in Minnesota and obviously with those kinds of activities, we need a robust body of GIS to be able to do our work. But what Metro GIS actually is, is a voluntary collaborative that the council sponsors. And so governments at all levels, city all the way up to federal actors, academia, nonprofits, and private sector interests uh, in that operate in the Twin Cities Metro, we have a forum that we get together and we develop um, projects, we determine what, what data we need, what kind of standards we need, and collaborative projects, interjurisdictional things that we all need uh, to work on, uh, to make our, to meet our business needs. And it was officially created in February of 1996, so we're celebrating our 20th year right now. I've been the coordinator in the last four years. Um, some of you may have known the previous uh, coordinator, Randy Johnson. I know, John, you know, you know Randy. Um, and so it was a very unique idea when it started, but sort of this interesting voluntary um, approach. And the council gives us financial backing. It provides uh, a small budget. I get $86,000 a year to, to commit toward interjurisdictional projects. One FTE, yours very truly, and uh, the council gives you know me a desk and a computer and, and um, pays for my mileage to come and talk to folks like you here. So why do we have a regional approach? Now in, in Wisconsin, you've got a very dominant metro area in Milwaukee. You've also got one in, in Madison and the Fox Valley. You get some pretty dominant metro areas. We have one super dominant uh, metro area. 54%, over half of Minnesota's population, lives in seven of our 87 counties. And there are a number of regional governments that were created by the legislature. We have an airports commission that handles all the airports there. We actually have a metro mosquito control district. We have a legislatively chartered organization to control nuisance insects in the, the, uh, um, the metro area. We have a Met Council, an emergency services board. Watershed districts in Minnesota have taxing authority. And we have a number of those in the, in the metro and also school districts. So you're looking at about 3.2 million people packed into those seven counties. So I'll give you a little overview of what's happening in Minnesota. It's actually very exciting. Um, for a long time, uh, geospatial data at the city and county level has not been freely available to the public. They're able to, in, under state statute, to sell and to license that data. All of these counties have so far, counties and the city of Minneapolis and the Bureau of the Dates have adopted resolutions that say, we're not going to charge for data, we're going to put everything out there and let people take it. Parcel data, road data, um, a whole variety of things. And it's really creating a very interesting change uh, in our ability to sort of work together and make good things happen. Um, as I said, in addition to the ones that have formally adopted a resolution, many of them are simply publishing their data out there without adopting a resolution at the county board level. They're just putting it out there. And this is a huge change from the past where cities and counties would uh, sell their data and they would license their GIS data. So I'm going to quickly step you through the last three years um, of a county map of Minnesota showing you um, kind of what, what's been happening. So we, like I said, we have 87 counties in Minnesota. Uh, in October of 2013, four counties in Minnesota basically said, we're just going to put our data out there. We, 
you know, the requests aren't big enough, we're not doing much cost recovery, we don't think we have any liability, we're not gonna worry about it. And so the lighter green, which is the, the green that these counties are in, basically said, put it out there with no policy. A dark green county means they adopted a policy, a blue county means it's under consideration, and orange means it is for sale or license. So on February 11th, 2014, Hennepin and Ramsey County, the two most populous counties in Minnesota, adopted resolutions at their county boards. I went to both of those. I went to the, the Ramsey one at nine in the morning and watched them adopt the resolution. I then went to Hennepin County that afternoon and watched them adopt that resolution. Then I went home and killed a bottle of champagne by myself. It was probably one of the 10 best days of my life because I've been working on this for years. Um, by July 4th of, of 2014, we had an additional three counties in the metro. Washington County was looking at it, Stearns County where St. Cloud is was looking at it. Um, and, and actually, and I know, three more counties, Anoka had joined them as well. Um, by April of last year, uh, St. Louis and Lake County had opened theirs up, Kitson way up in the corner, Big Stone way over in the western part, Stern, Sherburn, and Scott was looking at theirs in the metro. Um, and then Rice County and Itasca County began examining it by August of last year. Um, as of March of this year, I, Itasca went and adopted a policy. Clay County had been giving their data away since 1999, but they saw what we were doing in the metro, and they're like, we don't have a policy. We should probably adopt a resolution. So they used our resolution and adopted a resolution. And as you can see, um, we this is a, a couple weeks ago, and this is where we are now with Rice and Waseca counties just south of the metro, adding to that. And um, I'm working very closely right now with the GIS coordinator up in Carlton County, just outside of Duluth, and they are looking to hopefully open theirs by the end of the year. So we're now up to about 20 counties. So let's do a little historical context here. This is the last meeting of my group, the Metro GIS Coordinating Committee. You're required to wear a hat and look very stern and harumph in the back of the meeting. Um, so the question I have from a lot of people is, if geospatial data was, is, public data, it's publicly funded, it's created for public purpose, it's publicly produced by public agencies, why is it simply not freely publicly available? And we'll have to go back to the late 80s and early 90s to look at that. I got a little dot matrix printout for those of you who are nostalgic for the technology of the time. Um, so this is the least fun part of the, of the presentation. Really in the late 80s um, and the early 90s, you had governments starting to look at bringing in GIS and starting to work with it. And it's like, okay, well, we got, we got to figure out how to bring this in here. And they realized very quickly it was very expensive at that time. Hardware, software training staff, building the data for the first time, okay? And governments in Minnesota, city and county governments in Minnesota realize, well, we've ha we have to somehow do some cost recovery. How can we recover the cost of doing this? And in the 1990 legislative session, we have what we call the Data Practices Act in Minnesota, which basically has the premise, all public data is available unless it is categorized by the federal government, state government, or a special designation by the legislature that it can. So the presumption is that it's all public. But actually what they did, there was a group of interests um, that came together and said, look, we need to be able to do some cost recovery on this. And so they modified our Data Practices Act to enable cities and counties to sell their data. And if you're gonna sell your data, you wanna have people sign license agreements that they won't redistribute it or, or use it in certain ways. So over the decade of the 1990s, GIS began to proliferate a little bit more, more people are using it, more students are coming out of college with some grasp on it to be able to, to, to work with the technology. People already in departments are getting their hands around it, being able to work with it. And when cities and counties and agencies are using each other's data, they start to realize, ooh, what if we have errors or omissions in our data? Well, can, could we be sued if our data isn't correct? And so an additional piece of legislation was added in the 2000 legislative session which basically eliminated tort liability. So if you're a city or a county, let's say a county, you produce your parcel data, okay, and you, you basically put a disclaimer on and say, this parcel data was designed for our purposes. We create this under statute for the purposes of our county, and we don't make any claim that it's gonna meet your need. Okay, so then you're covered, so they can't sue you. If someone, God help them, doesn't hire a surveyor and just grabs the parcel data and lays it on an aerial and goes and builds something, that's, that's on their head. Um, so that was actually very important. So by 2013, we actually realized we didn't have a definition in statute in Minnesota of what geospatial data is. Okay, we're sort of 
wrapping what we need around the scaffolding of laws that was written a long time ago. And so we actually got a legal definition in statute of what electronic geospatial data is in statute. 16E30 sub 10 and 16E30 sub 11 was passed that basically didn't allow governments to sell data to and license data to each other anymore. If you're a government agency, if you're a county, you can ask your cities for their GIS data and they can't sell it to you. We don't want to have the taxpayers paying double for that, for that effort. Um, and at the same time, very shortly afterwards, seven counties in Minnesota adopted resolutions with two additional ones in 2015. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these curves that go on here too. Uh, again, it's pretty intuitive, but it was very expensive back in the 80s. That cost of producing GIS data declined and the revenue generated from the resale of the data was never quite exactly what folks had expected it would, would be. There was expected to be this big windfall to be able to, to get a lot of data, to get a lot of revenue from the data. But that value curve is very interesting and the discussion around value is really what's most important. The value of the data is not the money you can get for it. The more people who are using your data, the more valuable it is. And this was really seen by the, particularly the GIS departments of the metropolitan counties to say, this helps us justify having this massive public demand for this data, helps us justify have the department. The fact that we don't want to do custom cuts for utilities. We don't want to do custom cuts for the railroads. We don't want to do this stuff. We want them to be able to just go to the portal and discover it for themselves. Pull the data down and, 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 and go for it. Okay. Now I'm going to walk you through the definitions that we use in Minnesota when we say free and open. Free is a pretty easy one. We all kind of know what free is. No charges or fees assessed to data consumers for public geospatial data in its native electronic format. Okay? So if you do everything, it's just not that folks do this much anymore, but if you did everything in shapefiles and someone asks you for your data, you don't have to turn it into a geodatabase or create some other type of file format for them. You can just send them what you've got. So if they want you, if a, if a consumer wants you as a county or as a city to have a certain kind of data, you can charge them time and materials to convert that, but in its native format, whatever you're using internally, you, just, you can give it to them that way. Um, we take our definition from public geospatial data from two pieces in our statute, electronic geospatial data and public data. So we have our definition of um, what electronic geospatial data is and what public data is in our statutes. I realize these are Minnesota things that don't apply over here. Um, additionally, in the statutes, if you do mapping, if you create plat books, if someone comes in and asks you at a city or county to create a map for them, you can obviously still charge time and materials for your effort to do those kinds of things. If they don't want to do a custom, if they don't want to download the data and do a custom cut for themselves and they come and ask you, please just give us 500 feet on either side of our pipeline, you can charge them the time to still do that. And as I mentioned before, we have chapter 13 in our state statutes, which is our Data Practices Act. This act was written in the late 1970s, pre-internet, largely pre-GIS. And so we, our challenge is continually that these laws were written for the average citizen to come in and inspect the analog paper document at the city hall or the county courthouse. They weren't really written in the anticipation of people being able to download and, and look at these things on their own. The, the term open has been something that we've, we've worked to, to put together and I could have brought the main, the main points of that as well. And we use the terms free and open uh, with one another when we talk about this. So no license agreement with the data. So once you get the data, you've acquired the data, you've got county parcel data, um, you don't have to sign a license agreement with it. You're able to share that data with other people. Once it's left the county or the city, you're able to share it with someone else. However, as a best practice, we say, you gotta let them know where it came from. You gotta tell them where the authoritative source is. And there are no restrictions on the use of that data. All right, if I'm a real estate interest, I can get the county parcel data and I can do a bunch of value added to it, sales or whatever else, and I can resell that data. That has been seen by the counties as very desirable in Minnesota. Like, you know what? This, this makes sense. It helps foster entrepreneurship. Put it out there. The only thing, and one of the key things was liability. Again, they, folks are very worried about that whole, oh, what are, are we liable? As long as you include a disclaimer, as I said before, we made this for our own purpose. We, have no, we make no claims that can meet your need. Um, you're fine. And we have statute language in Minnesota that exempts cities and counties from any liability if there are errors or omissions in that data as long as you've got a disclaimer on it. So what kind of data are we talking about? What flavors of data are we looking at in Minnesota? 
this is the sort of the big list. Um, the big four are parcel data with uh, tax data attributes, road center lines, address points, and aerial imagery. Those are the four most demand, most in demand data sets uh, in Minnesota. But obviously, things like jurisdictional boundaries, school districts, commissioner districts, and natural features are some of the most in demand things that folks in all sectors need to get their hands on and want and want to work with. So that's the main, the main piece of that. Um, as I mentioned before, government to government sharing now is very easy in Minnesota. Governments are just able to ask each other for for the data and work with that. Um, government to the general public in the private sector. Now state and regional governments have never had the ability to sell or license their data. Only cities and counties. So states and uh, state government and regional government like the, like the Met Council and Mosquito Control and Emergency Services Board, um, when they, they've just basically put a lot of their data out there. Um, as I said, city and county governments have had under statute the ability to sell, to sell it and license it. And private utilities to government, if a government needs data from a private utility, there are rules in our administrative rules uh, in our statutes that, that guide how that works. It usually has to do with private utility using a right of way or a specific kind of project, uh, those kinds of things. So that's, all, that's a little more complicated than I have time to get into. Um, our next big exploration in Minnesota is going to be with infrastructure data. Um, and this is a continued uh, piece of interest to folks around the table that we want to be able to meet the, the, the business needs of the full geospatial community and at the same time protect the integrity of certain kinds of uh, infrastructure. But really when we look at this, it's tied to specific business needs. If I am working with a big engineering firm, okay, and we're bidding on a road building project that's going to go through a couple jurisdictions, my ability to understand all of the fiber networks and stormwater networks and roadways and bridges that I'm going to inter that I'm going to be plowing through enables me to provide a much better bid on what it's going to cost to do that. And so that part of the, that section of our community is very interested in having a lot of those things out there. There are other folks who are saying we're not comfortable putting our fiber optic network data out there for people to see because it's a mix of private and, and public. And so we're having those discussions on how to meet the diff divergent business needs and really understand it within the legal context. Um, and also there's a lot of talk about non-spatial records that once you add an address or record it to them become spatial data as well. So those are things we're discussing. Um, as we all know, in subsurface infrastructure becomes very complicated very quickly. Um, sanitary sewer, there's not many people that have a huge business need for that. The Metropolitan Council does and its constituent cities do. The counties don't really care that much about it because it's not something in their, in, really in their wheelhouse. Um, water systems, storm sewer, fiber optic, energy networks, and gas lines, again. Um, it's a mix of private and public interests. So again, we're researching how those things lay against our existing laws. So what are the benefits we're realizing now of free and open geospatial data? Well, we want to make sure there were benefits for both communities. It just wasn't just the producers and the cons you know producers having to put it out there and the consumers, you know, make reaping all the benefit. Really, this was driven in large part by the metro county saying it just makes we can meet our business needs better by putting the data out there freely. Um, less time and effort on their part to have to respond to requests, to have to deal with the paperwork of license agreement and collect and process and deal with fees through their various departments. Um, and so that was a big piece. But the other one is like more time for other projects. We have staff time committed to just handling these one, one by each requests. We don't want to use our talent for that. We have a number of other projects in our counties that we want to do. Um, but really sort of a philosophical part of it as well Government being proactive and saying, instead of the, the citizen coming in and having to fight through a bureaucratic process to get the, the data, it's right up on the portal, go get it. Um, transparency of operations, minimize, or maximizing public investment in GIS, saying, we've made as a county or a city this investment in GIS, and we want our citizenry to reap the benefit of that investment. Um, the, as I said before, the public demand coming in for the data helps the department justify itself and say, you know, we're not funding ourselves, you know, nickel and diming people. We're, we're saying we're providing good service. And if this went away, the public would really cry out for this. Um, it really has helped us facilitate collaborative projects. Now that the data flows so easily between agencies, we're able to work together to develop standardized data sets and data standards. And ultimately, the answer being yes. When you go to a government office, when you go to a government agency, and they tell you no, that does something about how you're perceived. And they, these governments are saying, we want to be perceived as a partner. We want to be perceived as someone who puts the materials out there. 
for the consumer, obviously the benefits are obvious. The availability of the data, uh, the ease of access and time saving they have, not having to sign agreements or go and jump through hoops. It's really been fostering entrepreneurship. Um, I was at a conference in South Carolina with the GIO from the state of New York a couple years ago and we did a presentation on this. If your data is not out there, the business community assumes you're not open for business. Okay, real estate, utilities, uh, manufacture a whole range of the business interests. They want to they want to locate and be in places where there is an availability of, of this kind of data. Um, it facilitates faster decision making in terms of real estate transactions, not charging costs back to the government. Which, if you're a, a private engineering consulting and you have to pay 15 grand for the county parcel data set, you just charge that back into whatever project you're in. So it's this sort of dead loop. Um, and again, the range of of users who are interested in this, nonprofits, utilities, real estate, and academia. I teach GIS at the U of M, uh, I teach as an adjunct, and my students are just like, oh, they're coming up with all of these amazing ideas and projects because they're able to get their hands on this data. Um, and lastly, I just want to let you know where we have some resources. You may want to jot the, our URL down. It's very easy. Uh, Metro GIS, our collaborative, has a website, metrogis.org, and under projects, we have a page dedicated to uh, free and open data resources. Again, this is obviously Minnesota centric, but there may be some um, interesting nuggets and things in here and we encourage folks to, to take it and use it and work with it. We have the research we put together. We have a one page blue sheet, that's sort of like your, your elevator speech fact sheet. And then we have a couple of white papers that we put together that are, are pretty helpful. We link to or publish a number of articles from the sort of national position on, on, uh, on open data. We have the current map of those maps I showed you earlier. I'm hoping to have some, at some point some animation, animation piece that shows that, shows where we are with, uh, at the county level. We have the resolutions that have been adopted by the, the 10 counties that have adopted the You can actually see that resolution language. Um, and we actually have sample resolution language up here that many of them have used or modified to their need. And I've also got uh, some PowerPoint presentations up there as well that we're happy to have people go ahead and download and farm the parts from. And, and my contact information is there. I've been one of the folks kind of kind of spearheading a lot of the research to put that together. So um, feel free to make use of those resources. We try to do our new website very easy for folks to use. So just Metro GIS. If you just Google Metro GIS free and open data, it'll bring you here. So the white papers we have, um, what we sort of call them white paper one and white paper two. White paper one is essentially five small documents put together, 75 pages in total. Um, we've got a sort of um, write up about the benefits and challenges. Um, I interviewed a number of people around the United States in counties where they already make their data available to help convince our elected leadership this would be a good idea. Summarize some uh, public law cases from around the US. Uh, th again, this document was intended for our, our leadership to, to review this and kind of bring it to a, a really condensed form for them to understand. I have, it's probably less relevant over here, but some Minnesota statute relevant to the data availability and also some sample disclaimer language that folks can use as a resource. Our other white paper is something that's been more, more recent. This is still being updated as sort of a living draft. It's much more of a frequently asked question format. Um, and it's about 19 pages, but I continue, as I get questions from, from, from partners in greater Minnesota, we research that question, add that question to this document. So if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, keep your eye on this space. This document will be continuing to expand. And it also has links to legal resources in Minnesota for folks that have more detailed legal questions. So I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV either. Um, so the outreach with this continues, as um, some of you may know, Minnesota's having its GIS LIS conference in Duluth next week. Um, I'll be presenting a short lightning round on this. Um, we have our Geospatial Advisory Council uh, sending out an open data survey because we have this uneven, some are free, some aren't free in Minnesota. And we're also having an interagency panel of 90 minutes um, uh, on our statewide infrastructure. And data being open and available is really sort of one of the key pieces for how do we get a statewide set of infrastructure available, a geospatial infrastructure put together? So um, with that, we really say the tide is turning. Um, the next wave is, is open data. Um, and governments are, we feel in Minnesota anywhere are well served by embracing it. So um, thank you so much. We have, we have our little free and open geospatial data logo. I was told it looks like the Cthulhu character from the Lovecraft myths. <laughs> the tentacles coming up. So we jokingly call it our open data Cthulhu. So, if you ever hear that. But anyway, I'm, I'm easy to find. Not me, not many people have the weird spelling of their first name and last name like me. So if you want to get a hold of me, Google me and, and, and pull me out. I think there's a football player for some college in Texas that has the same name as me. Other than that, so I'm not him.
I've never played offensive line in my life. But you know, please get a hold of me. I have questions, and I think I have, do I have time for a few questions? Okay, yeah. So I'll be happy to answer any questions, sir. Matt. So does Metro GIS then provide like central? clearinghouse or repository for this data do the data distribution or is this all on the counties then? We did, the metro for the metro region, we did until 2000, 2015. We had Data Finder, which was where all the metro partners could have their stuff. We now have the Minnesota Geospatial Commons, gisdata.min.gov. It's our central state clearinghouse. Many counties are putting their stuff in there and some counties are just having a link in there back to their county, to their own portal. So a number of the, the in what we call greater Minnesota outside the metro, they are using the commons as sort of their spot to go get data. And then some counties are, like Hennepin County maintains its own portal because it's massive. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Sir? I have an anecdotal story about the selling of data from Ramsey County. I was there in the mid-90s and we sold the data twice to Excel Energy and SB. Uh, within like a two-year time period for 150000 each time. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And the thing was, is nobody else could use the data or buy the data, but nobody could afford that. And then it just sits there within the county repository and nobody's using it. It's, yeah. I, I guess I'm looking at the open data as a uh, already paid for stimulus package. Yeah, it really is. And one of the things we found too is that it creates a double standard because counties were sort of interpreting rules their own way. If you say, okay, we'll give it to this nonprofit, but we're going to ding this real estate agency five grand and we're going to ding Excel Energy um, seven grand for stuff, you're maybe putting yourself in kind of an uneven and potentially actionable position of not treating clients equally. Um, I know Douglas County, Wisconsin, you mean John Fiskness? Um, He's, he's a joint GIS guy with City of Superior and Douglas County, and, and they were getting requests. They have a, you know, they're a big break in bulk point to the Superior Port up there. They have a lot of pipelines and railroads and things coming in there, and they were getting requests from like Burlington Northern and, and Bridge Pipeline and whatever else. Can you just give us this chunk around our asset? Can you just give us this? Can you just give us that? You're spending a lot of time pulling that out. The county attorney's like, what are you doing? You're treating them, you're not treating them all equally. Just put it up, let them do it. Let, just put the data up there and let them do it. So I actually had a lot of conversations with him. They put theirs out for free in 2010. Um, and so those kinds of discussions really led us to realizing, yeah, it is. It's an economic engine. It's, it's as you saw from those curves, it's really already sort of bought and paid for. Um, and the more it's out there, the more it's used, the more it's actually a different kind of definition of value. So yes, ma'am. Um, two things. One of the things that kind of uh, coming out from Brad's comment in regards to um, charging for the data and showing, do you have a lot of um, firms that Bid on projects show that return on investment because I think we, most of us have to you know, kind of justify this for our county boards and the people that hold our purse strings mm -hmm. in regards to. I, I think it's a great idea too, but I think that if they could, if we could have businesses put that in as a part of their RFP or or their final contract to show that you know this is what the return on investment by giving them the data is. Yeah, that's a good value. And then other thing is I was at Hennepin County Reporter's Office several years ago. And of course, they still do um, certificates of title forms. And uh, one of the things I was kind of amazed at is they take a the nice you know, parcel map, paper parcel map, took a clear overlay, and hand drew on there their, title, their certificate title properties. I mean, I, that kind of surprises me knowing how robust your Metro GIS consortium is. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know well, you know. let, let me take your questions in reverse order. So the first one, one of the things that we we got into because there's a lot of you know survey folks you know and they're very like oh it's not the it's not the legal documents we never said it was the digital data is a virtual representation of legal documents if you want anything for a legal you know this is you know you can't use this for any kind of legal stuff this is representational only and in the in the courts this would be demonstrative rather than substantial for any kind of case you would use and you actually need to go back and use the actual survey documents I'm sure this is true in Wisconsin and Minnesota there's very very distinct language about what surveyors do and how their plats are stored and what kind of symbols they use that's a very very different discipline than that um, and to your first question the um, the cost recovery yeah talking to you know again engineering firms is basically saying yep this is a part of a line item we got to buy this data and, and that was part of the justification, like just put it out, they charge us back for it anyway, just put it out there, so yeah. 
I don't want to trespass on the next speaker's time, but a couple minutes. Okay, sir. I guess just one follow up. Have you seen then that the the policy makers, the county boards, city boards, whatever, are providing sufficient funding to these departments to maintain this data? If there's this cost recovery or this this economic benefit, then the door should be open a little bit to release some funds to do an aerial photography or do a lidar project. Yeah. And Every community is struggling with budgets. Yeah, we've found in Minnesota that so I mean, particularly in the metro, very large population counties, very mature, um, well-resourced GIS departments. They're finding, yeah, we were we were spending sixty grand in staff time to make twelve grand in revenue, and we, in the survey that we, I just mentioned, in many counties in Greater Minnesota, they're maybe pulling in anywhere from two to five grand a year in revenue and it's probably a wash in terms of staff time to do the cuts and, and do those things. So we are encouraging counties in Minnesota to take a hard look at your effort versus return. And if you're getting a lot more, if there's other things your time could be better spent on doing than doing you know, cuts and selling your data, you should, you should look at that. And that's really one of the drivers. So in most counties, the, the staff time versus revenue raise is a wash or a loss. And that's one of the actual things. No one has really taken a lot of time to look at that until we did in the Metro, and that's really been creating this sort of effect of, and then being able to help those folks communicate to their county boards and their leadership. Say, look, yeah, we bring in five grand a year, but I'm spending eight to 10 in staff time to, to make that five grand, and that's, that's the disconnect. And if, if I didn't have to do that, I could get all these other projects done. So that's, that's the piece. And that's really sort of those curves I showed, it's sort of the maturity model. The more mature you become, and you're less dependent on the sale of the data, because the original justification for doing that was actually sound. It's like, the stuff was really expensive back in the day, and it's just, it's not the same now. So that's a good question, and we encourage every county to do it. And if you're dependent on those sales, that's, that's what you gotta do.